atmosphere of growing crisis, London dispatches again express the belief that Japan is about to collaborate even more openly with Germany, that Japan is about to embark with the Germans in a plan whose ultimate aim is to seize and hold all the strategic points governing ocean traffic. Berlin. Germany and Japan will soon be at war with the world. For these men, modern war means mobile war, in which their hunger for conquest is driven by a thirst for oil. Oil is the untold story of World War II. Oil was a very important dimension of the global conflagration called the Second World War. It had a critical impact, a decisive impact, on strategy and the conduct of the war, and it was central to the outcome. Hitler came to power in 1933 in the midst of the Great Depression. He built the Autobahns, a network of superhighways. He put Germany back to work. Das neue deutsche Reichsautostraßennetz ist nicht nur in der Anlage das gewaltigste, was es diese Art auf der Welt gibt, vorbildlichste, das es gibt. Es wird auch mehr als alles Übrige mithelfen. Die deutschen Gaue, die deutschen Lande miteinander zu verbinden und in eine Einheit zu zwingen. A Germany on wheels was essential to Hitler's vision of war in the 20th century. Hitler was fascinated by modern technology, especially by uh, motorization. Motorization was the key to conquer large parts of the Soviet Union and of other parts of Europe. 1936, the Berlin Auto Show. Hitler took great pride in Germany's technological prowess, but Germany had almost no oil of its own to fuel Hitler's war machine. Germany's oil problem in the 1930s was a microcosm of Germany's general resource problem. The country is extraordinarily poor in natural resources. Coal, water, wood, earth, air, that's about what Germany has. And that's been, of course, over the uh, period since the Industrial Revolution began, one of the great impetuses to German chemical development. German chemists were the best in the world, and Germany's leading chemical producer was a company called IG Farben. This was a firm that had enormous amounts of cash. Uh, 1925, IG Farben was the biggest private corporation in Europe. In the middle of the 1920s, the challenge was to convert one of those few resources that the Germans had, brown and uh, hard coal, into the lifeblood of a modern industrial system. IG had shown it could make synthetic oil in a test tube. Now it began to produce over 2,000 barrels a day. Coal was pulverized and liquefied under high pressure. The result was a substance with much the same properties as oil. It was an achievement that won IG scientists the Nobel Prize for chemistry. But by the late 1920s, this expensive process, which was a very big engineering effort, was languishing because it simply could not compete with cheap oil on the world market. And it continued to languish until Hitler came to power and he recognized in synthetic fuels a solution to one of his major problems as he built his war machine. German fuel production must be developed with the utmost speed. This task must be handled with the same determination as the waging of a war, since on its solution depends the future conduct of the war. Hitler was in a race with time to get ready for war. 
began in 1939. Hitler invaded Poland in the first of a series of blitzkriegs. The main idea of blitzkrieg warfare was to end the war as quickly as possible uh, by a campaign which would overrun the enemy because Germany had a crucial lack of raw materials. It could not afford to fight a long war. It had to get definitive success before the raw material question would come into play. When Germany occupied France, she conquered large stocks of oil. And in 1940, the German oil situation was quite a good one. With the fall of Western Europe, Hitler's next target was the conquest of Britain. The Battle of France is over. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. In the summer of 1940, the German Luftwaffe pummeled Britain. For a time, it looked like the Germans would win. Again, help would come from a test tube. While German chemists had invented a substitute for oil, the Americans had refined it and created a powerful new aviation fuel. Hitler's Air Force ran into the technological skills of the American oilmen. They had developed during the 1930s a 100-octane fuel that had proved to be critical in the Battle of Britain because it gave the Spitfires greater power, greater lift, greater maneuverability in their air battles with the Messerschmitts. Battle of Britain, Hitler suffered defeat for the first time. Today was the most costly for the German Air Force for nearly a month. It was officially announced that by 10 o'clock tonight, 175 raiders were known to have been destroyed by our fighters and anti-aircraft guns. Harvard University. In 1919, its campus was graced by an impressive and entertaining young officer of the Japanese Navy, Isoruku Yamamoto. Admiral Yamamoto was a very bright man. He came to the United States ostensibly as a student at Harvard, uh, but didn't really spend any time in classes there. I could find no record of his having uh, attended classes, taken examinations, or gotten marks. But what he did do was to travel around the United States. He wanted to see the extent of oil in the United States. He observed the tremendous productivity of the oil fields. Every place there were gushers and uh, oil was being piped and trucked uh, all over, and there seemed to be no end of it. This extraordinary American oil industry was supplying 80% of Japan's oil. Yamamoto recognized that oil would be absolutely essential in the modern age, and it would be absolutely essential for a modern military. Japan invaded the Chinese province of Manchuria in 1931. It was the first step in Japan's quest to capture all of Asia's vital resources. Workers were forced into slave labor and raw materials shipped back to Japan. Japan would call it a co-prosperity sphere. The term at the time, in my opinion, was really a code word for Japanese empire or imperialism because it was used to justify 
the expansion into North China and ultimately into the southern, southern area region. Uh, the vocabulary was about cooperation, but the practice was clearly an imperialistic move. The Japanese had plans to dominate all of Southeast Asia. An island nation with few resources, Japan coveted the raw materials of the entire region. But the biggest prize lay furthest south, in the islands then called the Dutch East Indies. In this tropical paradise lay one of the world's richest oil reserves. But the oil of the Indies was already spoken for by American, British, and Dutch oil companies. For the Japanese, this became the most important strategic target in the Pacific. From the Japanese point of view, the Indies represented autonomy. That was the prize, because if they could control Indies oil, they felt they had enough resources in every other area to be autonomous and would not be controlled by the United States or anybody else. The man who would lead Japan's effort to get the oil was General Hideki Tojo. Tojo was called the razor, which was meant to capture the sharpness of his character. He was totally and completely devoted to Japan's expansion, to its creation of an empire that would encompass all of Asia, and he took the lead among the military men in pushing Japan down the road to war. As Japan's atrocities in China mounted, Americans became outraged. There was a tremendous amount of American concern about Japanese behavior in China. Sympathy for the Chinese people and the, the hue and cry in this country led to a progressive uh, attempts to cut off Japan's oil supply. American public opinion clamored for an embargo. President Roosevelt feared an embargo could provoke a war. But when Japan invaded Indochina, today's Vietnam, his cabinet debated what should be done. Nobody had an idea what to do except Morgenthau, Treasury. He said, let's freeze Japanese funds. Roosevelt, okay, but don't cut off the oil. He said that in the cabinet meeting itself. Well, the mechanism for freezing funds had the practical effect of cutting off Japan's ability to buy American oil. Therefore, for all practical purposes, in July of 1941, we cut off Japan's oil supply, and the clock started ticking. In Japan, Tojo was named prime minister. The razor reacted sharply to the oil embargo. How can we let the United States continue to do as she pleases? I fear that we would become a third-class nation after two or three years if we just sat tight. From Japan's point of view, time was of the essence because the longer they waited, the quantity of oil that they had, particularly for the Japanese Navy, would um, be depleted by that much. And therefore, it was very crucial to come to some kind of a decision, some kind of a compromise or a war, one with the other, uh, as quickly as possible. Among the leaders most opposed to war was the man who knew the U.S. firsthand since his days at Harvard, Admiral Yamamoto. To fight the United States is like fighting the whole world, but it has been decided, so I will do my best. Yamamoto was convinced that if Japan was to take the Indies, it must first take out the U.S. fleet at Pearl Harbor. For months, he and his Navy pilots had been secretly rehearsing the attack at a secluded Japanese base. The theory was that once they got the oil, they would have to ship it by sea back to Japan. What was the major threat there? The American Navy. Where was the American Navy? Pearl Harbor. So the real thrust at Pearl Harbor was an intent to knock out the fleet to protect the oil supply. December 7th, 1941. The attack on Pearl Harbor 
tripled America's Pacific fleet. The Japanese made this film recreating their victory. In the film, American oil supplies were a prime target, but in real life, the oil tanks were left untouched. Yamamoto's staff was debriefed just after the war by Captain Roger Pino. He wanted to know why the oil tanks weren't attacked. I asked Admiral Tomioka that very question. I had showed him a picture of the attack on Pearl Harbor taken from an attacking plane. And I said to him and his staff, uh, uh, former staff officers who were at our meeting, you know, you gentlemen know what this picture is. And he's, they all smiled, said, yes, that's the attack on Pearl Harbor. And I said, do you know what those round white circles are up in the top of the picture? And they all nodded, yes, and Admiral Tomioka said, that's the fuel tank farm on Oahu. And I said, how many bombs did you drop on that? And he said, no bombs, not a target of attack. With that storage supply of fuel gone, the United States fleet could not have moved. And since the immobilization of the United States fleet was the basic reason for attacking Pearl Harbor, it's peculiar that it didn't occur to the Japanese to knock out the oil tanks. The Japanese were thinking not of America's oil supply, but of their own. Just 10 weeks after Pearl Harbor, they landed in the Indies. Before being evacuated, the oil men laid plans to sabotage the wells and refineries. At that point, there was only a small contingent, about 15 men left, and they got out by boat. And when you talk with them, I've talked with uh, uh, Lloyd, his name was Shorty Elliott, huge man, his name was Shorty Elliott. Afterwards, he said it was a mixed feeling, because on the one hand, they were destroying their life's work, the other hand, it was exhilarating. Japanese brought with them a team of oil men from Japan with the invasion. And actually, they got the fields back in operation in about two months' period of time. They never reached the same production level that was going on before the war, but they got the production up and was adequate for Japan's supply for about two or three years. Right after they took the fields and got it back in operation, they felt they were going to win. Hitler, too, was dreaming of oil. The great oil fields of the Soviet Union. June 1941, Germany invaded Russia. This is Berlin. Our German troops are advancing into Russia speedily, a German propaganda company report said tonight. The reporter compared the campaign to that in Poland because of the character of the terrain and the speed. When he embarked on Operation Barbarossa, Hitler hoped that it would turn out to be a blitzkrieg like the ones he had waged against France and Poland. Uh, and at first, his successes were dazzling. But soon the territory the Germans were conquering became their enemy. This distances in, in Russia are unbelievable. Russia is not a country, Russia is, is a continent. 
You cannot finish with a blitzkrieg of some months or some weeks. I had uh, going say three months is the maximum time we need to break uh, the resistance of Russia. This was completely wrong. Without proper roads, German tanks and trucks burned twice the fuel anticipated. As the weeks dragged into months, dirt roads became rivers of mud. The weather became worse very soon. First with rain and snow and storm and later with a terrible cold. So that the German advance really stopped in the mud. As oil froze in their engines, the German advance stalled on the outskirts of Moscow. Hitler and his generals renewed their argument over strategy. The German generals wanted to eliminate the powerful concentration of troops that defended Moscow. That is good military doctrine. But Hitler wanted to turn southeast towards the Black Sea and the Caucasian oil fields. Most German generals hoped to fight the decisive battle in order to beat Russia. But this was somehow an old-fashioned viewpoint. Hitler had a more modern approach towards war. My generals know nothing about the economic aspects of war. In the end, Hitler decided oil would be the objective. This was Hitler's very personal decision, because he knew that the generals of the Army High Command had little understanding to fight a campaign in order to occupy oil wells. There was one general who shared Hitler's vision, Erwin Rommel. In an ambitious plan they called the Grand Strategy, Hitler would dominate not only Europe, but all of the Mediterranean and the Middle East. If it worked, Hitler would control the oil of the Caucasus. Rommel would thrust across North Africa, cross the Suez and move up through the Middle East to link up with forces advancing toward the oil. It was an audacious plan tailor-made for Rommel. What set Rommel apart from most other generals was his instinctive feel for the battlefield. He knew when to attack, uh, how to attack uh, at the most unexpected point and achieve success, and this he did repeatedly. Rommel's Africa Corps took on not only the British, but more than a thousand miles of the North African desert. Fuel for his tanks and for his trucks was always a limiting factor. Between Tripoli and Benghazi, you're looking at five or 600 miles. So there were tremendous distances and there was simply not enough gasoline. Uh, what Rommel did was to capture, when he could, and he did often, uh, fuel stocks from the British, and he actually used them as, as, as filling stations en route. At one point, 85% of Rommel's transport consisted of captured vehicles. It frustrated him not getting that same resourcefulness from his supply officers. It has become the habit for quartermaster staffs to complain at every difficulty instead of getting on with the job and using their powers of improvisation, which indeed are frequently nil. Rommel hugged the coast, tanking up with fuel delivered at ports along the way. But as time went on, his shipments dwindled. The British had broken his codes, and they were listening in as he demanded to know when the next tanker was due. Rommel, in his desperate effort to assure himself the oil supplies he needed, became, in a sense, his own enemy, because he was asking not only where is the oil, but on what ship it is, when will it arrive, and this was all very valuable information. 
June 1942 at El Alamein, 100 miles west of Cairo, short of fuel, Rommel's campaign ground to a halt. By comparison, the British were swimming in oil. They were now commanded by General Bernard Montgomery. Unlike Rommel, Monty was a cautious general and refused to go into battle without ample supplies on hand. His oil came not only from the Middle East, but as far away as America. It was plentiful and reliable. Fearing that time was working against him, Rommel ordered the attack. But the British defenses held firm and the Africa Corps was forced to retreat. Rommel recorded the battle in his diary. August 31st, 1942. Due to heavy going, the Africa Corps petrol stocks were soon badly depleted. At the 1600 hours, we called off the attack on Hill 132. Rommel was a legend on the battlefield. But without oil, he was helpless. Finally, he flew to Europe to meet personally with Hitler at uh, the Fuhrer's headquarters on the Russian front. He begged for more oil, but all he got from Hitler were promises and a field marshal's baton. While Rommel was away, Monty counterattacked. The Battle of El Alamein sent the Germans reeling. Rommel rushed back to North Africa, but could do little more than direct the retreat. Monty had taught him a bitter lesson. The bravest men can do nothing without guns. The guns, nothing without plenty of ammunition. And neither guns nor ammunition are of much use in mobile warfare unless there are vehicles with enough petrol to haul them around. Rommel's defeat in North Africa meant the shattering of the grand strategic vision. Now the question of the capture of Baku and Russian oil depended exclusively on the German armies that were fighting in the Caucasus. first stop on the road to the great oil field at Baku was Maikopf, a smaller field in the foothills of the Caucasus Mountains. General Steinhoff was with Hitler just before the victory. I met Hitler in 42 in September. Uh, he was flying high, he was in very good spirits, and he said, uh, now I have the oil, now I have Maikopf. And then, after having the oil, I proceed along the street across the mountains to Baku. Uh, if I have the oil, we can proceed to India. He was mighty mistaken. Capture by the Nazis of a Caucasian oil field turns out to be a hollow victory. The Russians have applied the scorched earth policy and the prize for Hitler's oil prospectors is a blazing ruin. German cameramen had been sent to photograph a success story. The pictures they took fell into Allied hands and are a permanent record of a great offensive that failed. The Battle of Stalingrad started out as a sideshow to the oil campaign, but it turned into a decisive battle on the Eastern Front. Field Marshal Karl von Manstein begged Hitler for reinforcements from the Caucasus. In a midnight call, Hitler refused. It's a question of the possession of Baku, Field Marshal. If I can no longer get you the oil for your operations, you will be unable to do anything. Good night. Heil, Field Marshal. Heil, mein Führer, was all Manstein could say. But the route to Baku was blocked in the Caucasus Mountains by fierce Russian resistance. Hitler's dreams of Baku oil turned into a nightmare. The effect on the German economy 
was deadly. This was, of course, for Hitler, who was probably thinking in terms of energy uh, for first hand, it was a his defeat. From then on, he knew he would not win the war. Christmas, 1941. Admiral Chester Nimitz arrived to pick up the pieces at Pearl Harbor. He was keenly aware of the strength of the Japanese Navy, but he was also aware of Japan's biggest weakness, its supply line. Japan's empire extended over Asia and the Pacific. Its oil supply line was long, stretching thousands of miles from the wells of the Dutch East Indies to Japan. The Japanese were anxious to finish the job begun at Pearl Harbor. Oil was literally the most critical factor in the timing of Yamamoto's war plans. As he said on many occasions, the Japanese Navy could fight for one year, but after that, he did not know. Six months after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese launched their attack on U.S. forces at Midway Island. This time, the Americans were ready. Once again, oil proved to be a critical factor. When the Japanese planes returned to the carrier decks in order to refuel, that was a moment of maximum vulnerability. At that moment, the American planes appeared and attacked the carriers, sending four of them to the bottom of the sea in what turned out to be the decisive turning point in the Pacific War. Nimitz now went after Japan's oil supply line with a vengeance. To demoralize American submarine crews, Japan turned to Tokyo Rose. We know very well that American submarines have headed west from Pearl Harbor. If American submariners are wise, you will turn back. Certain death awaits you over here. And now I'll play for you, unfortunate Americans, a popular recording. The Navy effectively cut off Japan from its raw materials in its colonies. American submarines are very effective, and Japanese are not quite prepared for submarine war against the United States. So with submarines all over Southeast Asia, it became more and more difficult to ship these goods back home. And so there was no, um, no point, I mean, having conquered these things. If you cannot make use of them, uh, there, there was not much point in doing that. And I think that was the, the fatal flaw in Japanese thinking about this. For the Americans, supply logistics were central to strategy. Warships no longer had to go back into port, but could refuel from roving oil tankers. They helped give the Navy in the Pacific its long legs. As the Navy went island hopping westward, huge floating bases were established offshore, complete with oil tankers and fuel barges. The scale was really enormous. On one island alone, the American forces were delivering 120,000 barrels of oil a day. Consider that against the Japanese Air Force, whose entire consumption was only about 20,000 barrels a day throughout all the military theaters. So on this one island alone, six times as much oil was being delivered by the Americans as the Japanese Air Force was consuming everywhere. American oil flowed so abundantly in the Pacific that it was even poured on dirt roads to keep the dust down. But the effort to supply oil in the Battle of the Atlantic was faring badly. The Navy reports that the 8,000-ton tanker Pan Massachusetts has been attacked off the Atlantic coast. 
and there are other but unconfirmed reports of additional sub-attacks. Just as American subs were stalking Japanese tankers in the Pacific, so too were German U-boats plying the Atlantic. The Battle of the Atlantic is being fought with oil and will be won by oil. It has finally reached into American garages and gasoline tanks. Every filling station is now on the battle line of democracy. To achieve victory, America would be called upon to supply six out of the seven billion barrels of oil used by the Allies. U.S. oil czar Harold Ickes was confident he could deliver. His first step was to get the oil from Texas to the northeast. The Big Inch was born. It's the last mile for the big inch. To the eastern states, the world's largest oil pipeline, built in just one year, will carry a 1,500-mile river of oil from Texas fields at the rate of 300,000 barrels a day. The sponsor of the $95 million dream pipe, fuel chief Harold Ickes, promises more gas for the east, but not for non-essential driving. Big job of the pipeline is to supply the armed services with fuel for attack. June 6th, 1944. D-Day. 175,000 troops hit the beach at Normandy. Right behind was the oil. The invention and manufacture of the lifeline, which carried petrol for the Allied armies in Europe, is a work of genius. Dubbed the pipeline under the ocean, or Pluto, it was an achievement for its time but it ran into technical snags and ended up carrying less than 1% of the Allies' needs. The rest came like everything else, by ship. At first, the Germans succeeded in keeping the Allies bottled up in Normandy. Then came General George Patton. Patton had, had a, an instinctive feel. He was very much like Rommel in that he had an instinctive feel for the right time and the right place, for the battlefield. He knew when and where to attack and where the enemy was most vulnerable. Patton liberated one French town after another. But he left his fuel stocks further and further behind. To catch up, the quartermasters invented the Red Ball Express. Soldiers ferried gasoline up to the front in five-gallon containers called jerry cans, copied from a German design. There were 13 and a half million jerry cans on the continent, but never enough to go around. What became the really critical question was who was going to get the oil? Was it gonna to go to the British, to General Montgomery, was it going to go to the American First Army under General Courtney Hodges, or was it going to go to the Third Army and George Patton? To Patton, the answer was obvious. He knew that the Siegfried Line and that the area in Alsace and Lorraine was virtually undefended. And his position was simply that if you give me the gasoline, I can take Third Army into Germany inside of 10 days. No one realizes the terrible value of the unforgiving minute except me. We have at this time the greatest chance to win the war ever presented. It is such a sure thing that I fear these blind moles don't see it. But his boss, General Eisenhower, was committed to the Allied armies advancing on a broad front and decided to split the gas evenly. Patton was furious. My men can eat their belts, but my tanks have got to have gas. His demands fell on deaf ears. I have to battle for every yard, but it is not the enemy who is trying to stop me. It is they. If I could steal some gas, I could win this war. Patton did not discourage his troops from obtaining gasoline by any means necessary. And, and one of the means with, by which they would obtain it is that uh, sometimes some of his troops 
would, would change their patches and pretend to be a first army unit. They would go to a first army depot and draw gasoline. In other instances, uh, captured cigarettes or wine or booze would be used and would be traded for gasoline. Gasoline was so important that he was willing to overlook what his men sometimes had to do in order to obtain it, in order to try to keep Third Army going. But Patton's tactics required a vast amount of fuel. Without it, his advance stalled. It really became a situation where the Germans were able to, to bring in some reinforcements. The weather changed for the worse, and, and Patton ended up with a, a, a number of battles of attrition, particularly around Metz, uh, that turned out to be very costly. Patton finally got his gasoline, but for him, the unforgiving minute had passed. He believed, and many historians believe today, that if he had been given the fuel he had needed and he had been able to keep going into Germany, the Second World War in Europe might well have ended nine months earlier. The American Air Force was convinced that the way to shorten the war was to target Hitler's oil supply. Allied strategic bombing forces turned their attention to the German synthetic fuel plants. IG Farben's experiment of turning coal into oil had grown into a vast industry. By now, synthetic fuel was virtually Hitler's only source of oil, and more plants were desperately needed. To build them, IG tapped a new source of labor, the concentration camps. There's no question that those plants could not have been completed had IG Farben not employed the slave labor. And altogether, in the course of time uh, for the construction of these plants, something like 25,000 people died either on the site or as a result of being returned to the camp where they were gassed afterwards. The Americans prepared to make synthetic oil plants their number one target. The American Air Force under General Spartz proceeded to launch two very heavy attacks on the synthetic oil plants. The German response was immediate. The signals unbuttoned at Bletchley Park showed their great alarm. The synthetic oil plants had been providing 90% of Germany's aviation fuel. Albert Speer, Minister of Armaments, rushed to inspect the damage. The enemy has struck us at one of our weakest points. If they persist at it, we will soon no longer have any fuel production worth mentioning. Our one hope is that the other side has an Air Force general staff as scatterbrained as ours. The Americans prosecuted this campaign with great vigor, making in all nearly a hundred attacks and production of aviation spirit as required by the German Air Force had sunk to a quarter of 1% of what they needed. Ironically, the Germans had just developed the world's first jet fighter. But with so little fuel, they needed farm animals to get it to the runway. This movement on the airport was partly done by cows. And if you looked at this picture, having three of the most modern jet fighters sitting on the ground and taught by cows. This makes, makes a picture which is unbelievable, ridiculous, ridiculous. But this has shown our present situation. Premier Kuniaki Koiso is warning his Japanese tonight that the Americans will no doubt increase their bombings on the Jap mainland. 
This comes in the wake of the greatest B-29 attack so far on Tokyo, portions of which were turned into a shell. In Japan, too, the situation was getting desperate. Young boys and even girls became the backbone of Japan's workforce. With food already scarce, potatoes, sugar, and rice were now converted to alcohol to fuel the factories. Lubricants were extracted from soybeans, peanuts, and coconuts. But the most extraordinary concoction was used for aviation fuel. Pine roots. Uh, some people thought that uh, one could get oil from pine roots. And even as school children, we were sent to the fields to dig out pine trees. And then somehow or other, they would be squeezed probably for oil, things like that. Whole mountainsides were stripped bare of every tree and sapling. But even that was not enough. So the Japanese hierarchy devised a desperate plan to make their pilots more successful fighters. The pitch they made to the pilots was, we are losing planes without getting any results. This is not a matter of force, but any pilots who wish to participate in this very effective attack method, uh, they can put their names in a bowl. There is no coercion, there is no shame if you don't. They emphasize this. But every pilot on the base at Mabalakat uh, put his name. They crawled out of their hospital beds to come and put their names in it. And this was the beginning of the Kamikaze Corps. And it was very effective. What had taken up to eight bombers and 16 fighters to do before was now accomplished by one or two suicide attackers. And it also saved fuel because there was no return trip. Of course, not every plane hit its target. One pilot fished out of the water gave valuable clues about the state of Japan's oil situation. Nearly all forms of training have ceased in Japan. There are two men in each plane, because neither of the two men were experienced enough to pilot the plane alone. Pine root is used for fuel, but the process is absurd. It takes about 100,000 roots for one plane to complete a mission. At the time, of the dropping of the atomic bomb, the Japanese were preparing for a final suicidal resistance in which millions of people, Japanese allied troops, would have been killed. But the fact of the matter is the Japanese war machine was almost paralyzed because it had run out of the oil that it needed to keep running. For the first time, the emperor spoke to his people. Mm. People on August 15th, when they heard the news that the emperor had decided to surrender, people just went to the palace uh, to bow their heads, uh, hundreds of them, feeling uh, a guilt, guilt that they had let the emperor down. Finally, it was over. The war had cost upwards of 50 million lives. And to the end, oil played its part. American military authorities pulled up in front of Tosho's house to arrest him. He appeared at the window, said he'd be down in a moment. Then a gunshot rang out. At that moment, Tosho, who had taken Japan into war, saying that the country was going to run out of oil, Tojo's own life hung in the balance, not because there were no doctors, because there were doctors about, but because they could not find an ambulance with gasoline to get to him. Finally, they did, and they carried him off to a hospital, and he was eventually put on trial and executed. As the Russians closed in on Hitler's bunker in Berlin, he made plans for his own suicide. He killed himself, and then his aides took his body 
And there, midst the ruined monuments of what was to be the Thousand Year Reich, they doused his body with gasoline and set it aflame. Next, on the prize, crude diplomacy. Post-war America celebrated the wonders of oil. Oil could win wars, it could fuel factories and cars, and even more importantly, it could make lives more comfortable than ever before. But the West's need for oil was drawing it inexorably into the turbulent, age-old intrigues of Arabia. Based on the Pulitzer Prize-winning book by Daniel Yergin, The Prize.